If you remember, a couple of years ago, we introduced what we called our 2030 Greater Vision as a reminder because I have to be reminded every week, uh, uh, and I love to remind myself that this vision is not from us. This vision comes from one of those Old Testament prophets by the name of Habakkuk, who, like the rest of the prophets, were looking forward to the coming of a Messiah, a long-awaited Messiah who would come. And like many of us, in the middle of his waiting, there were hard times, and his prayer is recorded for us in Habakkuk 3 verse 2 where he says Lord I have heard the news about you and I am amazed at what you have done I love the fact that he says he's heard the news about you because if he's heard the news about you that means somebody's talking and isn't it true that when you have great things that have happened in your past people talk about it don't they whether it's your family just this these past two weeks that we've had ups and downs with with my family especially my dad's health there have been times we've gathered around the bed and we're thinking that he's about to be with Jesus and he's back with us again and going back and forth in the middle of the joys and the tears there are those moments of remembering the great things and the wonderful things. And I think it's natural, whether it's a church body or whether it's a family or any organization. And maybe as you'll do this Thanksgiving, when, when you look back and, and you remember the things that God has done. And he says, I'm amazed at those things. And that's where we were last week. We talked about uh, the amazing things that God has done. We reflected the same way that Habakkuk does. How he's led us from a group of 25 people in a home to a group of about 70 people in a school cafeteria, then a gym, then purchasing this building. How he has grown that group, that initial group of 25 to over 1,600 people who meet on our campus each week. How he's given us space and allowed us to reach our community in new and unique ways. How his great commandment to reach the entire world to make Jesus known and his uh, great commission to love God and to love people like we love ourselves has become the mission of our church. So that mission it defined what we would do. That mission would mean that we would seek to bring food to the hungry, both spiritually and physically. That we would get involved personally with the lives of people who have special needs. And that we would go for providing nights like Night to Shine. And then playgrounds, uh, Sumner County's third all-inclusive playground uh, for people of all abilities. And then we would look and see what can we do weekly to help families who have special needs. We looked at providing dental service and counseling services to those who didn't have it. To be a major volunteer in the housing market for people who didn't have a place to live. And now building three Habitat homes and financially sponsoring two of those ourselves. To providing for hundreds of orphans in different countries. And funding the building of classrooms in Africa and uh, health centers where they are taught the word of God daily. To bringing medical and dental and clean water villages. To people who don't even have the basic things that, that we take for granted. And that mission of making Jesus known and loving God and loving others would drive how we spent the first three million dollars of money that you guys raised. That it went right back into our community and our world. With the idea that that's what it looks like to really say that we love our neighbors like we love ourselves. So when I read Habakkuk's words, Lord, I have heard the news about you. I too am amazed at what he has done. I felt the same, Father God. I'm amazed at what you've done in our church family. But he doesn't end his prayer there. Habakkuk looks to the future and he says these words, Lord, do great things again in our time. And isn't that also natural? That in a time when things uh, maybe aren't the way you would want them to be, whether that's health or financial or the economy or politically, that you do maybe look back at a time when things were once one way and your prayer becomes, Father, would you, would you do great things again? Don't let the great things be something that you used to do. Would you make those great things happen again? And say it with me, when? In our own days. In our own days. I wonder if Habakkuk knew this principle. The greatest danger to future success is living in your past. Almost every leadership book out there will tell you that. That the greatest danger to any future success is living in your past successes. All you have to do is ask some companies like Kodak, who once were big in the film, but now not so much. Or, or IBM, who has seemed to, to come out of the transition, but for many years struggled in, in making the transition from big mainframes to smaller home computers. All you have to do is look and say the greatest danger to any organization, including the church, 
is thinking that success is defined by what we have done in our past. And I think Habakkuk is saying, I don't want our past to be our legacy. God is always about doing a new thing in a new generation. So he prays, Lord, would you make those things happen again in our own days? And he prays with the specific knowledge that when we ask God to do a great thing, or when the prophet Habakkuk asked God to do a great thing, he has to know something. He has to know that the way God does great things is through his people, his church, the people that he calls his own. That's the way he has always operated. One year ago, I said we presented our 2030 Greater Vision, and we briefly mentioned the item that we're moving into this year, the preschool. This year, we get more specific because we're ready to start and undergo the very first new building on our campus. And to be true to the vision that we had when we started Northfield, we knew that if we were going to ask you to help fund something like this, and we are, (laughs) that we could not, that we would not, ask you to be a part of funding something that would be used only one day a week. That was not a good investment for you or our us. So we said, we, we set out with, with two questions when we talked about the preschool. They were this, question number one. What can we do to provide the best Sunday ex- preschool experience possible for our Northfield children and their families? We chose preschool first because that's the area we were growing in the fastest. That's the area where we had the most crowding. And uh, 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 number two, the second question we asked was this. How could we use the building not one day a week, but every day a week to make a generational impact for our families and the families in our community to help make an impact So we found a builder we told you about last week, Visioneering, and working together, we developed a plan that is for a brand new 12,000-foot preschool to be erected on this side of the building. I think there's a picture there of how it's going to look in reference to the auditorium. Next, we found a preschool partner for the weekly programming and running a fully accredited STEAM program. Last week, several of you asked me what STEAM was. STEAM is a preschool program based, or it could be any program, but this is specifically a preschool program based in science, technology, engineering, arts and mathematics. I have a short video clip to show you of how the preschool and integration with the church works. I hope you enjoy it. The idea of Pathways Learning Academy was really generated to help churches take an underutilized space, which is their Sunday school or their child care preschool area, and be able to use that during the week. We, as Learning Care Group, we can come in and operate a child care early education experience for families, providing value to members of your church community and the greater community during the week. It was created in the mindset of starting kids within a safe, healthy, honest, trustworthy environment and starting them on that pathway towards their later education, kindergarten and beyond, um, which really sets them up for, for a great life. So one of the advantages to working with Learning Care Group is leveraging the more than 50 years experience and 900 schools in operation we have today. And we have taken those learnings from all of those schools and all of those years, and we provide that same support to you. We have a number of partnerships uh, with a variety of Fortune 500 companies, universities, hospitals, even government agencies. For those organizations, we operate a full-time, on-site, childcare, and early education uh, operation for them. Day in, day out, they have a whole team back at our Sports Central headquarters that is supporting them as well to ensure the kids are safe, healthy, and getting the best quality education they can. In addition to the academic programming that our staff will provide, we will partner with you to have a member of ministry come in to do a faith-based integration with the children as well. We really do share the same values in the effect of that safety, that honesty, that trust that we're trying to accomplish through our curriculum, through our early education program that we offer. I really do think that matches along with what these ministries are trying to offer in catering to their communities and opening their doors to the communities around them.
And again, I hope if you were not here last week, I encourage you to go on and listen to that message where we give you a much expanded view of the impact of having a five-day preschool program can make on our local church. And then last week talked about funding that uh, Northfield Greater Vision. As a refresher, this is one of the slides that we showed. Uh, $9 million five total costs. That includes sprinkling the building, getting connected to the sewer system. You've already given $3.8 million to that cost already, leaving a balance of five seven seven. Which means we are at the point where financial institutions are ready to jump in with us. Uh, we usually present our year in vision in December. The reason we moved it to November is because if we close by December 15th, they are giving us a construction loan of $5 million. Three years, 4.95%. Because we already have this much in the bank, we will not have to borrow that much even to start with. And I think through what I'm going to show you next, we will never even have to approach borrowing that much. Uh, so uh, with all those things going on, this next part is very important. It really shows our goals. We had three that we laid out for you last week. A celebration goal of 778514, because that's what we need to get started in January and to close the loan by December 15th, that much. Dream goal is a million. And we're going to celebrate because that's what it takes. Dream goal is a million. We're going to celebrate there too because we've raised a million dollars the last two years at the end of each year. And if we meet that goal this year and the following three goals, what is left, then we will only have to borrow 1.7 million of that five. And guess what? The proceeds from the preschool will pay that 1.7 million dollars. So if we do what we've done the last two years, the next three years, uh, it will be kind of like a, a net wash for everything that's going on and and we'll be able to do great things there. God go. The reason we put a God goal is there. Every starting point, I tell you, if you've been through starting point, you know, if God's not in it, we don't want to be a part of it. And God sometimes will prompt you to do incredible things that are bigger than you can imagine. And we want God to be a part of it. I love what he says in the book of Malachi. We'll talk about this one day. Not this day, but uh, he says, test me in this. Bring your whole tithe into the storehouse. What does that mean, bring your whole tithe into the storehouse? Because that's the testing mark. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. We want to set God goals. The next slide shows where we are right now. You've already given this year 365000 across the board, meaning that for the rest of this year, by December 15th, trying to get this amount this amount or that amount. And I'm going for that God amount. That's what I'm purposing and praying for. And I hope that you are too. And then one last item before we dive into We Are Church. Last week, I briefly told you about a grant, brand new giving option we're making available. That option concerned giving appreciated stock. And the advantages of that are numerous. We've got a handout for you. Looks like this. It's on the screen. I know you can't read it from here, but if you didn't get one on the way in, there at every door on the way out, I encourage you to get one. It tells all the ways that you can give at Northfield, but it particularly goes into detail on the back about how you can give uh, appreciated uh, stock to this campaign. Uh, we partner with a company called Overflow who makes it very easy. You can get there by going to northfieldchurch.net slash give, choosing the second option, Overflow. I tell you, uh, since my days of permitted explosives, I've had a, I had an Ameritrade account, and then that transferred into Charles Schwab when they bought Ameritrade. And so I tried it this week, and I thought, well, I'm going to experiment with that. And I transferred a stock from there. It is so easy. Even a pastor can do it. I'm going to, like, tell you, within five minutes, the, the hardest thing for me was finding the password to my Ameritrade account. Or, or the, That was the hardest part. It was so easy to do. And I know that that is new. That's a new way to give for for some of you, for others who have been in the business world a while and God has uh, blessed you where you have stocks that come from businesses, well, this is old news and you have the opportunity to give. And the biggest advantage when you give from things like this, uh, it, is a, it defers the capital gains tax for you and then it comes into the church fully non-taxable as well because we're a 501c3. And you get to deduct the full market value of the stocks that you gave. It is a win-win situation. And as four or five people did last week, if you've got questions, come see us. But that website will give you a whole lot of information about how to do it. So, hey, that's our, that's our first 10, which might have went 12. But we're going to jump into the last 20 that looks like it needs to be about 12 itself. So we're going to see how this goes. If you've been with us a while, you know that we've been in a series that we're calling We Are Church. And what we've said is this. The church is not a building. The church is not a time. It's not a place. Uh, the church is a people. In fact, the church is, say us with me. The church is us. 
Because we are church. We defined a church, I believe, like Jesus defined church in Matthew chapter 18 when he made this promise to his disciples that they were going to be a part of building something that was so big. He calls it the ecclesia. Next slide there, the ecclesia. Uh, he says, upon this rock I will build my church. That word church meant ecclesia. And ecclesia was not a building. Ecclesia was a group of people. It was a gathering of people. We defined a church from Jesus' definition like this. The church is the called out group of people. That's us. Empowered by the Holy Spirit to continue the work of Jesus on earth. And if you remember, I started with, you know, when I started, this, I didn't even know what to call myself. I, you know, do I call myself pastor or minister? And then I would get letters to, to reverend and to holy and all this stuff. And I thought, oh, I don't feel like any of that. I just feel like Tom. And uh, Janet Wyndham sent me the neatest little video that, that I got a kick out of. And I hope that you... You will too if you've ever to, tried to describe pastor or reverend or, or church to people. Maybe this will help. People often say to me, they say, Jay John, you know, wh what do you do? Uh, it's always very difficult to know what to say. Because if I say to you that I'm a reverend, which I am, that conjures up certain images in people's minds as to what I might be. So I like to be a little bit creative in telling people what I do. I sat next to this lady on an aeroplane at Heathrow Airport, and I said, hello. And she said, oh, hello. And I said, where are you going? And she says, I'm going to Singapore. Then she said to me, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Australia. I said, what do you do? So she told me. Then she said, what do you do? And I said, well, <laughs> I work for a global enterprise. She said, do you? I said, yes, I do. I said, we've got outlets in nearly every country of the world. She said, have you? I said, yes, we have. I said, we've got hospitals and hospices and homeless shelters. I said, we do marriage work. We've got orphanages. We've got feeding programs, educational programs. I said, we do all sorts of justice and reconciliation things. I said, basically, we look after people from birth to death, and we deal in the area of behavioural alteration. <laughs> she went, wow! And it was so loud, her wow, loads of people turned around and looked at us. She says, what's it called? <laughs> I said it's called the church. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I loved when I read that. And I think that's what Jesus is as we opened up in the book of Acts a few weeks ago. I think Jesus is telling his disciples that this church, this thing that I'm telling you are going to be a part of, it's more than just your home. It's more than just local or regional or national, but it is global. Again, we left off in the book of Acts. Acts is the fifth book in your New Testament. It follows Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell us about the life of Jesus on earth. The book of Acts tells us what happened to those believers after Jesus went back into heaven. And the Gospels end with a charge from Jesus that we call the Great Commission. It's found in all four Gospels. It is most popularly quoted from the book of Matthew, where Matthew quotes Jesus like this. Therefore, go. Now, this is a charge to all of us. And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you even to the end of the age. And I'm sure when he said this all nations thing, that that would have been hard since they had been conditioned to think of Jewish people. But the promise given to the father of their faith and the father of our faith, Abraham, was that one day that through the seed of Abraham, not just the Jewish people and not just Abraham's people, but all people of the earth would be blessed. Well, because they, the way they've been raised and because they've been taught that Messiah, when he comes, well, he would restore Israel to her glory days of kings and princes. They asked this question, Acts 1, 6. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Still thinking in terms of an earthly kingdom. And they confused the idea that they had been raised with of a conquering might makes right type of power with the power that Jesus is speaking of. So they ask him this question, is this the time we conquer? Is this the time we take over? And Jesus brings them back and reminds them that the gift and the power he is speaking of is not a power to overthrow Rome. 
that the gift and the power he is speaking of is going to enable them to do something. This power is the power that will enable them to fulfill their life's purpose on earth despite what their government or any government might do to them. He says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he says, almost ignoring their uh, question. <laughs> uh, he does say in verse 7, you know, that's not for you to know. Let me tell you what's important. But you will receive power. If you remember that word power we talked about a few weeks ago comes, uh, the word there is dunamos. It comes from the English word where we get our dynamite. It was an explosive type of power, a power that would do something great, but not great in the way they were thinking. You will receive this dunamis, dynamite type of power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. It was not a political or might makes right type of power as with Rome. It was a power that was, that was greater than any world power they could think of. It was a power that would be different from what they knew. This power would not be an outside force type of power. It would be an inside force that lives within them. And in Acts 1-8, when he says, you'll receive this power, he wasn't telling them, I'm going to give you a controlling, oppressive type of power. I'm giving you a power that will make you different. He was telling him, my power will allow you to speak with the very powers that are against you. My power will help you live the way that I live. My power will give you the ability to live differently than any other power. And when you live that way, the message of Jesus was this. The people around you are going to go, whoa. Well, you, you're not troubled by the same things that trouble us. The same things that bother us about our land and all this stuff. They don't get you down like other people. And you're like, no, because I have this not greater than power. I have this different from power. He refocuses their attention to their calling. It's not your calling to overthrow Rome. It's your calling to be by witnesses in spite of what Rome is doing. To tell the story of redemption and to give your life for the story you're telling. Because how many times do you, at times, uh, it's so easy to get caught up in, in saying things like, well, I can't fight that addiction anymore, or I can't face this, or I can't offer forgiveness, or I can't reconcile with them. I can't fill in the blank. Jesus is telling his followers, you can do what I've called you to do. It's just that too often you try to do it in your own power. And he says, some tasks are so big that it's going to take my power. And you needed a power to accomplish what I'm doing in your life. In fact, he goes on and he says, this power comes upon you. It would be the Holy Spirit and you will be my witnesses. And as we said, that word would have concerned them because that wit word witness, it actually is the word from where we get our martyr, word martyr. He was saying to them, you will not only live your life telling the story about what you've seen because that's what a witness does. You will tell my story, but ultimately, you will lay down your life for the story you were a witness of. And in those moments, you don't need a Rome power. In those moments, when you're called to lay down your life, no political party will ever matter to you in those moments. In those moments, the only power that will make a difference in your life is a power that comes from the inside out. It's not a Rome power. It's greater than that. And it's different from that. Greater power will make you fight an earthly fight. Different from power will enable you to lay down your life. You will be my witnesses. And then where we're going to close today. In Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus says this mission that I'm giving you is always outwardly focused. If you were to look at the geography of Israel in this land, he talks in their homeland, he leads them out locally, then he goes to the areas that they would really not have chosen to go on their own, and then he says to the ends of the earth, which to me says that any movement of God that is internally focused is not a movement in line with the great commission of God. That every movement of God for us, yes, there are 57, 59, depending on how you count them, one another scriptures on how we treat one another. But at our core, our mission is always an outwardly focused mission going into the world and going into the places in people's lives where we have. The mission that I'm telling you is that there's this natural progression from where we are to where we want to be. And aren't you glad he allows you to start in Jerusalem? Jerusalem's your hometown. Jerusalem is your turf. Jerusalem is your hood. You know, it, 
it's the place where ministry starts. It's the place you can identify where you can find that person who looks like you and acts like you and you can get something going and, and you kind of all speak the same language. You know, you've got different flavors of your southern there and some of you are you and some of you are y'all and, and then you, you pull some Detroit people down and some Sacramento and L.A. people this way and they're a tad bit different. But basically, you know, we're, we're kind of all the same. And I love that he says, I'll let you start in Jerusalem, but if you start and end in Jerusalem, this is not the gospel. This is not the power that you're going to need. Because the power you're going to need, you need to go into Judea. Well, if you know the countryside of Israel, you've got Jerusalem, but the surrounding areas are Judea. And Judea is the people that I call, they're kind of like you, but there are differences. They kind of have the cultures, but they are, there are a little bit ethnic things going on. They're, uh, you know, different. The way I have said it in the past, and I don't know if this is good. I consider Judea, if you're my age, uh, um, uh, if I could make an analogy, if, how many of you remember when texting came about? Like, like, I remember a time before texting, BT as they might call it now. And then I remembered the first time that our daughter did not come down and tell us something, but texted us something from her bedroom. And I'm thinking... If I am going to learn to talk to her, I mean, she's my, you know, she's ours. We're kind of together. We know each other. But I got to figure out this new thing. I got to figure out what BFF means because I don't know if she's calling me a bad name or like if she's telling me that somebody's done something bad to her. And TTYL, well, what is that? Talk to you later. Go figure out. How do you figure out that kind of stuff? Judea is those people that, you know, you can figure it out. But they're a little bit different. But Jesus says, guess what? I'm not going to let you stop there because that's still too comfortable for you. He says, we're going to, take, we're going to go from home. We're going to take it to your surrounding area. And then we're going to go into Samaria. Samaria is the place you wouldn't want to go. Samaria is the place where the racial boundaries are blurred. Samaria is the place where you wonder, will they hurt me? If I go there, they're not like me. I don't understand their traditions. I don't understand their customs. I don't understand sometimes why they do the things that they do. Jesus says, I'm going to tell you this mission of making Jesus known to the whole world will take you from your home to your locality. It will take you to the Samarias of your life. The entire story of the Good Samaritan was a story that would have been radical in the days of Jesus when Jesus made a Samaritan the hero of the story. The whole story uh, in John chapter 4 of the Samaritan woman at the well is a story of Jesus intentionally going through an area that the Jewish people would have avoided. They would have avoided that like the plague because there were, there were tension. There were racial tensions. There was so much going on. And Jesus makes a startling statement to his disciples. He says, I have to go through Samaria. And it really wasn't geographically that he had to go through Samaria. Because Samaria, they could have done what every other Jewish person did. You could have gone around it. You could have gone up either side. You could have gone up the Mediterranean side. Or you could have gone up the Jordan River side. But Jesus says, no, I have to go through Samaria. And I think he tells you, church, if you're going to be this outward focused group of people, you're going to start in your hometown. Then you're going to go out to the areas around you. But guess what? You're going to have to choose to go to Samaria because it's the place you wouldn't choose if you just live in your comfortable life. Choose Samaria. And then he says to the ends of the earth. And kind of what I like in this area that we are in now is he's, he's kind of bringing the ends of the earth to us, isn't he? Like you'd look around how Middle Tennessee has grown. And I see a lot of you who are realtors and here's a yes. Like I've been selling homes to people from every place, not only in our country, but other countries. So much in all of that that he is saying in the book of Acts, Jesus is saying, you're going to be my witnesses. And if you're really going to be the people to represent the kingdom of God, then you're going to have to go into all of these places. My church will always be an outwardly focused church. And this vision that we have laid out for you today is just part of where Jesus has to start in our home. It's our Jerusalem. And I think he's bringing people into our area from the Judeas and the Samarias and even from across the country and the world that we're blessed to live in. And I believe this preschool is just the next journey in making a difference in our home to the people that God has brought into our home. I was once asked, when, when do you stop? You know, you got a 20-30 vision and so it goes and you're thinking about the next three years. And although there may be times that we rest, there's never a time that we stop. You know why we can't stop? Because the mission is too critical. It's too important. I was 15 years old when I first went to England. 
the church I was a part of had a mission trip to go to London and work with the church there for three weeks. And to my amazement, my parents let me go. We would work on most days telling anyone that uh, would listen the story of Jesus. We sang in the streets. We did outdoor vacation Bible schools. And on off days, we would tour the English countryside. I remember even as a 15-year-old young man touring those huge buildings that uh, were now abandoned. Few of them are going to come up on the screen. And in the middle of those huge cathedrals, some of which would have seated thousands of people, there were smaller rooms. Maybe they were classrooms at one time. I don't know. They had huge, elaborate auditoriums, and we had to pay to get in. But outside of tourists like us, they stood empty, like many of the cathedrals do on the hillsides of Scotland and Ireland today. There were lines of folks taking pictures of the architecture, the intricate artwork that were painted in the stained glass. And I wonder if whoever built those castle-like cathedrals ever imagined that one day they would stand empty. That one day, the only people who would come would be tourists taking pictures of what once was a great and growing dynamic body of people. That what was once a testament to God's working, a place where people could come find healing and forgiveness and salvation, was now just a monument to what was. That's why we can't afford to stop. The mission of an entire world is too critical. The children God brings each week to us from your families are too important. The community that is out there, too critical. And I don't know if you've noticed, but the world is not building school buildings where the love of Jesus can be taught openly and freely anymore. And the powers that be, well, seem to be taking the message of Jesus away. But the good news of the ecclesia is this, is that the church can be our church outside of our walls. And you do that well. You have done that in incredible, remarkable ways, and you continue to do it. But it also says that we can be the church within our walls. That we can be the church to the people who come here, and we can invite the community in, and we can give children that come our way the best preparation that they can have to start school, delivered right alongside a message that there is a God who loves them, who cares about them, who has a purpose and a plan for their lives. And the children and the parents who live in and are moving to our Jerusalem from the Judea and the Samarias and the ends of the country, I believe are worth making that sacrifice to make it happen. They are worth both going to, and they are worth both building for. When Aaron was in his late teens or early 20s, he brought a GPS that I fell in love with. I did not even know what a GPS was. And uh, so when he showed me it could help me not get lost, well, I borrowed it every time I got the chance. I felt a special kinship to it because if you remember, it was called Tom Tom. And uh, I thought, well, it's, it's my deal. It's made for me. And, you know, now they're so common, they're just kind of built in. But back then, wasn't the case. I like driving down the road and having it tell me, you know, you know turn left in 100 feet or turn right in 500 feet. And whenever you, uh, whenever you messed up or whenever you didn't make the right turn, do you remember what it would say, those of you who are maybe my age? It was, yeah, that's right. I saw Ashley rerouting, rerouting, rerouting. Now, it, I think it may even say that still. Siri may say that to you because she reroutes me quite a bit. And I love the idea that it didn't say, you missed the road, idiot. You know, <laughs> because it would be saying that a lot. And I wonder sometimes if the people of the world have been turned off to the church because sometimes instead of our mission being to reroute people into the right phases of life, too often they've got the idea that we've said, you missed the, wrong, you missed the turn, idiot. That maybe sometimes the way we put things is that maybe Tom Tom had it right all along. I'm not here to judge why you missed the turn. I'm not here to evaluate what made you do that. I'm just here to say, hey, could I reroute you and put you on the, on, on the path that you were meant to be on? And when I think of the church, the called out group of people empowered by the Holy Spirit to continue the work of Jesus on earth, I think of Tom Tom and I think of our mission is that we are to reroute the people in lives who've taken, even sometimes our own selves, who've taken ourselves off course for whatever reason and gently put us back on a greater path. And I cannot think of any better way to do that than start with the very smallest of little human beings that God has given us and saying, hey, we want to give you the best the world can offer, but we want to give you the best that God can offer. 
And so right alongside this education, we're going to present to you the gospel plan of salvation, how you were meant to make a difference in the world you are living. I hope it is a dream and a vision and a passion you can get behind. Uh, 102 of you have sent me a text or an email about something I asked you a few weeks ago. I asked if you would like to go through the book of Acts in uh, starting the new year. That has been a resounding more than any other thing I have ever been given. Yes. So that's where we're going to start. We're going to pick up this story in January and we're going to look how did that early church make such a remarkable difference in a world that seem to be against them. And we're going to dive in next week in looking at the greatest gift Jesus has ever given or we've ever been given through Jesus and uh, generosity and what that looks like. Culminating on uh, Christmas Day or Christmas Eve, which is a Sunday this year, we will have four services. We're going to be doing baptisms. We do baptisms all the time. But if you have been thinking about it, and I think it would be very special to say, you know what, on the day that we celebrate the birth of Jesus into the world, I'm going to celebrate my new birth in Christ. I hope that that will be something you'll let us know. You'll find ways through the coming weeks to sign up for that. Just know we love you. We're for you. And uh, I pray that you will get behind this mission and, and be a part of it. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being a good God to us. I pray that you will go with us, that you would grant us peace, and that you, Father, would be the God of all gods. I thank you that you are our living hope, that you are not dead. And I pray that we will be Jesus in the marketplace where we go. Thank Thank you for bringing Judea and Samaria and the ends of earth to us. Help us to love them well and help us to go to them every opportunity we get and even make those opportunities. And I ask it in the name of Jesus. The whole church at Northville said, Amen. Amen. You have a wonderful, wonderful week.